And um, now I will introduce myself. My name is Rosie Briggs. Um, I am here um, from my home in Lafayette, but I work for EcoCycle. I'm the Community Education and Engagement Manager, and I also am the manager for the Eco Leaders Network. This is one webinar in a series of Eco Leaders trainings. So what it means to be an eco leader is um, you are trained in the guidelines of recycling and composting and kind of outreach. And then you have a whole bunch of ways to interact and engage beyond that, but they're all totally up to you. So it's about a thousand folks in Boulder County and Broomfield. Each one of them does something totally different, whatever works for them. But it's a huge network of people who are basically zero waste ambassadors and sustainability ambassadors beyond zero waste. Um, and so if you're not an eco leader, many of you are, if you're not, um, you can sign up uh, I sent it out with the invite email and I'll also send out the link um, in the follow-up email. And um, uh, we also have transcripts if you need um, the closed captioning, that's also an option here. Um, so my intro for EcoCycle, or for EcoCycle is that EcoCycle, if you're not aware, is um, Boulder's, Boulder County's uh, recycler. So every time you put something in the recycling bin, it will come to our big old facility where it'll be sorted out um, and then, sorry, I'm getting distracted from the chat. Um, and we also do um, an incredible amount of programming and infrastructure and outreach and education and legislation beyond that. Anything that really falls under the zero waste umbrella, which is a very large umbrella, EcoCycle is doing it. We've been doing it since 1976. We're one of the oldest and largest nonprofit recyclers in the country. We brought recycling to Colorado, one of the very first curbside recycling programs in the country at the time. And uh, we also run the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials or the CHARM where you can take things like mattresses and bikes and plastic bags and all of that stuff that shouldn't go in your curbside but still have a recycling opportunity. Um, and um, this is the first day of July, which means that it's Plastic Free July. Um, plastic Free July is something that EcoCycle didn't make up, but we are very excited to participate. It's a separate organization, it's a, like a global movement um, but you can sign up, uh, if you scroll way up in the chat, I'll just put it in again. Um, you can sign up to participate with EcoCycle and it's just one email every week for the four weeks of July, where we'll uh, walk you through a whole bunch of ways to reduce plastic and make swaps and uh, establish how much plastic you're using and make goals and write legislators. There's a whole bunch of stuff to do. Um, so that's my intro, if I didn't forget anything. Happy July, we're excited to talk about microplastics. I'm here with Brittany who is my um, friend and coworker. And I'm very excited to have her here because I don't have to do the whole presentation today. Brittany gets to do it because she is the expert in microplastics. Um, Brittany, would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Yes. Yeah. Hi guys. Um, so I am normally in the schools department for EcoCycle. So my like regular job is I normally um, go into schools and um, teach kids how to recycle and compost. And then we do some other like basic uh, conservation lessons. Um, but kind of my side project for um, EcoCycle is I focus on microplastics and specifically looking at um, compost and composting programs around the country um, and in Canada as potential sources of microplastic contamination, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail. Um, so that's kind of my little niche area within the schools department. And that's how I became kind of the expert um, in microplastics for the schools department. Um, so I came to EcoCycle from a background in uh, marine biology and marine science. So my background is as a scientist. And then now I kind of have switched to kind of the outreach education side. So I am super excited to be here. Um, it is kind of a heavy topic, but I promise that in the end, I'll give you guys steps and things that we can make, changes that we can make to reduce the impact of the problem. And I think if you're ready, do you want me to pull up the slides? Let's do it. Uh, I love it, Marty. Marty, you're the best. I have a bunch of your kids in my summer camp this year. So I'm excited. Cool. Great, so we're gonna start. Here is 
our webinar. It is called Microplastics. How did we get here and how can we fix it? As Brittany said, it's a little heavy. Bear with us. We're going to try to be cheerful as usual. We're not going to sugarcoat it though. We're going to tell you what it's about. Okay, so I'm just going to intro really quick um, kind of what is what are microplastics and um, I'm going to touch on kind of the health impacts of them um, <laughs> because that's a scary part of it. All right, so microplastics are defined as extremely small pieces of plastic debris in the environment resulting from the disposal and breakdown of consumer products and industrial waste. Microplastics are small plastic pieces less than five milliliters long, <laughs> milliliters, millimeters long, which can be harmful to our ocean and aquatic life, as well as other things, which I'll go into in a second. So there are two types of microplastics. We go back one bit. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I always do that, I double click. There we go. So there's two types basically. Um, so primary is, so they're already tiny basically. They come from my, things like micro beads and cosmetics. If you get something like an exfoliant, you know, to put on your face, there's a bunch of little plastic beads in there and they, they start out as micro. Um, and then nurdles from plastic production. So when we talk about plastic production, we have a whole other webinar on this, how plastics get made, but uh, kind of the building block for plastic um, items are these nurdles, which is the best word, but we don't, are not fans of the actual thing. <laughs> the plastic. And then the second uh, secondary microplastics means that it started out as something big and then it kind of broke down into these smaller pieces. And when we say breakdown, we want to think that it means like compost, like decompose, actually break down. But what we mean here is that the, um, the plastic item is just turning into smaller and smaller pieces of plastic, which is, uh, you know, it can be more problematic than that big piece because um, those microplastics can more easily leach into soil and water and be swallowed and things like that. So uh, those are kind of the two camps, uh, two sources. And then I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with some statistics and we're, we, we're not going to like them, but that's where we are. Um, so all, all the plastics ever made still exist today um, in our environment. So that's a really sobering fact. And I think that we all on some level, if we're environmentalists and we're on this call, I think we all know that. Um, but it's it's hard to think about even that, you know, like every toothbrush you've ever made or ever used, every plastic toothbrush you've ever used still exists in the environment, let alone how long plastics have actually been uh, produced. You know, they were starting, they were mass produced starting in about the 50s. So that's a lot of plastic. And uh, even if it looks smaller, or you can't see it anymore, the plastic still exists. When we hear things like, um, you know, styrofoam will break down in 500 years. We don't really know, like it hasn't been 500 years since we've had that item. So um, uh, yeah, that's just something to always keep in mind. By 2050, if we continue on our current trajectory, there will be as much plastic in the ocean as fish. Hate that one. Microplastics have been found in Arctic snow as well as the rain in here in Rocky Mountain National Park. We're in Colorado. Um, Rocky Mountain National Park is just our backyard. It's where we play. So that means that um, since these plastics are reaching places that humans haven't brought plastic to, that means that the microplastics actually have actually infiltrated the water cycle itself. And so they're leaching into the water and then raining into places or snowing, precipitating into places uh, that wouldn't have <laughs> plastic in them um, physically before that. And then each year, 8 million tons, tons of plastics enter our oceans. And that's the equivalent of dumping a truckload of plastics into the ocean every minute. So a lot of these are kind of too, a lot of environmental statistics are kind of too big to comprehend, really wrap your brain around. And I'm, I know that I don't have to convince anyone here that it's a problem, uh, but we're gonna set the stage. We're gonna get more <laughs> uh, encouraging as we go on. So uh, I'm just gonna start out with our consumption of microplastics. So a lot of uh, folks who are concerned with microplastics are environmentalists for reasons like, you know, the fish <laughs> uh, swallowing plastics or, um, you know, the production of them and what that means for fossil fuels. Um, but another thing that we should be concerned about is our own, our human consumption of microplastics. And there might be a huge camp of folks who um, weren't necessarily concerned about the environmental aspect of something, but are concerned about the health aspect of something. So this is something to bring up for sure. So uh, here's just a picture of microplastics compared to sesame seeds, just so you can see. Of course, there's a huge range of size for microplastics, but just so we can kind of visualize how tiny they are. So. <laughs> Every week um, we consume or ingest five grams of plastic, which is what is pictured in this spoon here. It's like the size of a bottle cap. Um, and then every month with that same um, statistic, that same kind of tra trajectory, just doing the math, um, that's the same weight as 
um, five casino dice and it's enough to fill this um, bowl halfway up. And then in every six months, that's enough to fill a cereal bowl. So just imagine sitting down <laughs> at the breakfast table and eating a bowl of plastic. So we do every six months. Every year it's this dinner plate, it's 250 grams. And then every 10 years, it is this like life preserver, which is 2.5 kilograms of plastic. That's so much <laughs> to be in our bodies. And then I have one more. In our lifetime, we are projected to consume 20 kilograms of plastic. And again, this is kind of, you know, <laughs> this is not exact. This is not an exact science. They're just saying like, assuming we all live like around 80 years and um, the science that we have done about how much we have already consumed holds throughout those years, this is what it will be. But um, it is the equivalent of eating two of these recycling bins, which I don't think any of us want to be doing. Um, that's a whole lot of plastic. So that's my little intro about how much microplastics enter our body. And if you're out talking to someone about microplastics and what you've learned, um, you know, and they don't necessarily care about the environmental aspects, this is a, maybe a good thing to bring up. Okay. So now that we have no, like we know that microplastics impact us, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about the, um, the routes that microplastics potentially get into our bodies. Um, but first we're gonna talk about some of the biggest sources of microplastics. Um, this is one of those issues that's really, really hard to track, um, especially because so many microplastics come from the breaking up of larger plastics. So think about how hard it is to track um, what we call macroplastic pollution. So what you, what we see when we see litter, that's macroplastic. Um, it can be hard to track those pollution sources and now take that to a microscopic scale. It adds a whole lot more complication into what those direct sources are. But of course, there's people who are trying. Um, some of the best data comes out of the UN. Um, this pie chart comes from a panel from the ICUN. Um, some of the stuff, different scientists give different information. So there is tons of variability within these percentages. So none of these numbers are like synthetic textiles, 33%, that's it. Um, it's pretty variable uh, depending on what, where you are in the ocean and what scientists are looking at. Um, but generally the same patterns come out. Um, so the biggest thing is that this personal use, so those are those cosmetics, those microbeads from toothpaste or exfoliants, generally only make up about 2% of microplastics in the world. Um, the reason that this is so important is often this is what's legislated. So for example, Colorado has a ban against these being sold anywhere in stores. A lot of other states, even countries have bans on these. So this is a really easy source for us to get rid of. It's great, it's 2%, we wanna get rid of that. But as you can tell, we're only hitting the tip of the problem with just looking um, at microplastics. Um, another thing is plastic pellets. This only has it at 0.3%. Um, a lot of the papers that I've looked at that are a little more updated, this data is from 2018, say that plastic pellets are actually closer to about 10% of the problem. These are those nurdles that Rosie was talking about. Uh, synthetic textiles, so clothes made out of polyester, nylon, somewhere around a third of microplastics that are found in the ocean. Our car tires are about a quarter of what we find. Um, city dust, which is kind of a catch-all phrase for, we don't have a category for it, so we're going to call it city dust, is about a quarter. Um, and then road markings and rain coatings are about the remaining 10%. So I'm gonna go into a little more detail on some of the biggest sources. So those nurdles, they're kind of the new um, thing when it comes to microplastics. Like I said, some papers are saying they can be up to about 10% um, of, of microplastic pollution. And these are the pre-production blocks for making plastic. So if you own an item made out of plastic, it was a nurdle at some point um, in its life. And if it gets recycled, it's gonna turn back into a nurdle again. So part of the recycling process is shredding those plastics back down and then melting them. So it's part of 
the pre-production and it's also part of the recycling process. They do know about 250,000 tons of nurdles enter the ocean annually, but it's really hard to source. So, um, for example, in the United States, we've had spills of nurdles um, that have happened in Texas at uh, plastic production plants. So it's really easy. The plant is near river mouth. There's a spill near the plant. It's obvious it's right on shore. But the bigger issue is a lot of these nurdles are shipped across countries and across the ocean. Well, sometimes these shipping containers actually end up getting dumped into the ocean by accident. There's storms at sea, things happen, and then all of a sudden a shipping container full of nurdles gets dumped. It's not often not reported. It happens in international waters far away from anywhere where there's no one to watch. And scientists can't always pinpoint exactly where it came from. And so we're getting nurdles that have washed up on shore where scientists know that they're several months old based on the degradation of the plastic, but they have no idea where they came from. So the biggest issue with nurdles is it's next to impossible to track and to put fines on these polluters. So because we can't, we don't know where it came from, we can't slap a fine on a shipping company if we don't know who did it. So micro, microfibers is one that you and I might be more familiar with because it comes from our clothes. It's something that we wear every day. I know that I am currently wearing clothes that are made from synthetic material. Um, in order to give you guys a break from hearing my voice for two and a half hours, um, the guys who did Story of Stuff did a great um, introduction on uh microfibers and why microfibers specifically are such an issue. Um, so I'm going to let them explain it and then we'll get back to it in the end. What do you think when you hear the word polyester? 70s leisure suits? Sweaty smelling dress shirts? That's what polyester used to be. These days, everybody wears it. Yoga pants, fleeces, even underwear. All made from synthetic fabrics like polyester. More polyester means more demand for the stuff used to make polyester. But you don't have to use new stuff to make it. Some companies are making polyester out of old stuff. Plastic bottles, in fact. Every day, the world throws away billions and billions of plastic bottles. That's a problem. Of course, the real solution is that we all use less plastic. But it's cool that even while we work to reduce plastic, some companies are turning trash into stuff we actually like. Drink it, drop it in the bin, take it to a recycling factory, chop it up, weave it, wear it, wash it, wear it again, wash it again. Seems like a great solution, right? But don't worry. When we look closer, there are some real problems with this. The big problem is that some people might be encouraged to use more disposable plastic if they think it's being recycled safely. But there's also a little problem, a micro problem that's adding up to one big mess. Every time we wash synthetic fabrics, whether they're made from recycled bottles or brand new materials, super tiny pieces of plastic called microfibers wash off and flow down the drain. Up to hundreds of thousands each wash. The older our clothes get, the worse the problem can become. Yikes. These fibers are so tiny, water treatment plants don't catch them all, so they wind up in rivers, lakes, and even the ocean. When they reach the ocean, they act like sponges, sucking up other pollutants around them. They're like little toxic bombs full of motor oil, pesticides, and industrial chemicals that end up in the bellies of fish, and eventually in the bellies of us. It's gross. It's already estimated there are 1.4 million trillion in our oceans. That's like 200 million microfibers for every person on the planet. These are some serious downsides to what looked like a good solution. Time for these creative companies to go back to the drawing board. Because while we can wash our clothes less or avoid buying synthetic clothing, we can't solve the problem without them. And if we want these companies to make it a top priority, they need to hear from you. Let's find a real solution to make our clothes safe for the environment, safe for the ocean, and safe for us.
Okay. Everyone hear me now? Perfect. Okay. So yeah, so microfibers are a huge issue um, that we tend to not think about because synthetic clothing is such, especially those of us who live um, here in Colorado, we tend to have a very active lifestyle. And with that active lifestyle, um, synthetic clothing tends to go hand in hand. Um, so it's definitely a problem that is becoming, we're becoming more aware of. And I will, I promise at the end, I do have solutions for you. So, and then we have our other sources. So tires are a huge source. There's a, a, a really large variability um, in the kind of the scientific data on how much of an issue tires are. Um, it ranges from there anywhere from 10 to 28% of oceanic microplastics. Um, tires are really cool um, because the microplastics that come from them are very distinct. They're like black cylinders. So it's really easy to tell that the micro uh, the microplastic is actually from tires and not from a nurdle or from some other source because it's a um, barrel, like a round barrel. Um, and these just come from us driving our cars on the road. So as we drive our cars on roads, tiny, tiny bits of plastic wear off um, because our tires are mostly plastic. Um, and then we lose weight in our tires. So all of you have seen, as we've worn our tires, the tread wears out. Um, our tires on average lose about two and a half pounds of plastic in their life. So the wearing of the tread is literally them losing weight and that weight has to go somewhere and it ends up in our environment. Um, road paint also has plastic in it. So at night when we see that lovely reflective shiny road paint, which is great because it keeps us safe, um, when it starts to wear off, it can shed microplastics. Fortunately, the biggest solution to this is just having well-maintained roads and infrastructure. So if we keep repainting those regularly and don't let them get worn off, we protect and significantly reduce that as a source of pollution. And then that final one, city dust, um, that's really just a catch-all phrase for sources of microplastic that don't have um, a specific category, like a specific point source. So it can be things like um, plastic from our shoes wearing off on roads. It can be plastic from our plastic cooking utensils. It, that's, uh, it can be some synthetic materials, basically anything that doesn't fit into any of these other categories is considered city dust. So now here's the secret source that we don't always think about and that's compost. So fortunately where we live EcoCycle, our composting glides exclude a lot of potential sources of plastic and compost. Um, but some places do actually include plastic coated paper products in their composting guidelines, which means, and I'll talk about why that's such a problem in a second, um, but there's other potential com contamination in compost. So those plastic produce stickers that people aren't always careful about taking off their produce, um, they end up in compost, which causes um, microfibers. And then some of the most recent research on compost is saying that this is probably a more significant um, source of contamination of microplastics into the environment than we have ever been aware of. So it's kind of one of those like, hey, it's always existed, but now scientists are just starting to look at it and they're like, ooh, ooh, maybe we should pay attention. So I mentioned those plastic coated paper products. So plastic coated paper products are basically anything that's paper that has that shiny coating. So things like uh, takeout food containers, um, paper cups, like someone in the chat mentioned Starbucks cups or any to go hot or cold cups um, are coated in plastic. Um, our milk and juice cartons are coated in plastic, frozen food boxes, all of those are plastic coated paper products. Um, a lot of times people are like, well, cartons are coated in wax, right? Um, well, unfortunately they haven't been coated in wax since like the 1960s. 
So both of them, both are regular refrigerated cartons, like those gable top cartons, like we usually get orange juice in or a shelf stable carton. Like you might get something like um, vegetable stock or chicken stock in are both basically paper with uh, PET on either side. The only difference um, between our refrigerated cartons and our shelf table cartons is those shelf stable cartons usually have an additional um, layer of aluminum in them. So the problem originally was a lot of composting programs were taking these things in their composting feeds. Well, EcoCycle never did and was always suspicious that these would be a problem in compost. So we, with another uh, lab in Maine, decided we're gonna actually do the research to figure out that this is a problem because um, no one had looked at what happens when these things end up in the compost pile. So at the time, um, Woods Hole was like a BPI lab. So if you ever get a container that is compostable and it has that label that says BPI certified, um, Woods and was one of the labs that would test for it. So there's a test that you do. Um, it's called an ASTM test. And basically they put it in a compost pile and they let it sit for a while and they test to see how well it actually breaks up in the compost pile. And that's how companies get approval to get that lovely sticker that we all look for before you put something in the compost. So what Woods Hole did was they took these things that we knew were not compostable. So things that are coated in plastic and they put them through this test to see what, was hap what happened. Um, so they did everything. So we just went to grocery stores and bought things that you and I can buy. So we bought things like juice cartons. We bought things like paper cups. We bought things like frozen food boxes. And to no one's surprise, the results were that they didn't break up. They didn't decompose um, to the point that when there's actually plastic coating on either side of the paper, it actually slows down the degradation of the paper on the inside. So if there is something like a uh, juice carton that has paper and paper, um, the paper on the inside can't decompose because the plastic is actually slowing that down. So as you can see, our food boat, are, these are both uh, different juice cartons, a Tropicana juice bar carton, and these are both frozen food boxes. All of them have um, plastic on them. And as you can see in this picture, nothing really happened at all after five weeks. So you would think maybe a little bit, but all there was was a little peeling. Um, and then compost in a traditional compost facility gets turned by something called a windrow turner. And the windrow turner actually caused more peeling and probably more microplastics to shed from these products because it's basically just kind of agitating it a little bit. So even things like paper plates, which are only coated on one side, basically just broke up into little tiny pieces. Um, paper plates are often not purely coated in plastic. It's often an acrylic coating, um, but even that partial plastic coating is still left behind. So in summary, to no one's surprise, plastic doesn't biodegrade um, and it slowed down the degradation of things that we knew were coated in paper. Um, and then we found that microplastic fibers were shed from every single sample, including things that looked the same when they came out as when they went in, they still found microfiber and microplastic samples in uh, the soil around it. And we do know most compost facilities when they're doing their like kind of final sieve uh, for their finished compost, um, their screens that they use are only about half an inch. So anytime something that's plastic that's smaller than a half an inch ends up in a compost facility, it's gonna end up in the finished compost. So why did we talk about this? 
Well, historically, um, in some composting programs, compost collection looked a lot like this picture. So people would put their compost in their food carton, they would stick it in their freezer, and then it was compost day, they would put it out on the street. Um, and that's how composting happened in some parts of the United States for decades. Um, and so the reason that we were trying to say this is bad is because we knew that there were places in the United States that were doing this. And we know that it's a problem. So studies from 2018 say that it's a problem. Even in composting programs that have clean guidelines, they're still finding some microfibers and microplastics, which makes sense. You guys are eco leaders. You all know that people make mistakes and put things in the wrong bin. But I do have good news. So when I said that historically, plastic has been collected like, or compost has been collected like this in the United States. Um, when EcoCycle started this research, about half of the composting programs in the United States were like this. And now there's only seven. So huge, huge progress has been made on this front on reducing the amount of plastic coated paper that ends up in the compost. Okay. So now we know where microplastics come from. Why do we care that they exist in the environment? So, um, well, we know that macroplastics are a problem, right? All of us have seen pictures like this of um, macroplastics impacting marine and land life. Um, we've seen uh, things eat large plastics. We've seen entanglements in large plastics. So it kind of stands to reason that microplastics would impact small things as well. Um, and we know this. So we know that small organisms will actually eat plastics. So I'm going to talk over this video. Um, but this is a video of different uh, plankton, different zooplankton, so different animal plankton. Uh, this specifically is an animal called a copepod. Um, copepods are kind of the basis of the marine um, food web. All of those little bright green dots that you guys are seeing are polystyrene beads or styrofoam beads. Um, this other organism that you're seeing it actually go into its stomach. Um, that's its little stomach there that you're seeing all those polystyrene balls um, absorb into. Uh, that's a salp. It's another uh, marine zooplankton. Uh, this guy right here is a zoea, so that is a the planktonic or free-floating stage of a crab so or a lobster. So that's what a lobster or crab looks like before they settle down and become big. So we know that teeny tiny organisms in the ocean, in marine environments, and also in freshwater aquatic environments, they're small um, organisms that are similar to this, small invertebrates. Um, yeah, small invertebrates also eat microplastics in freshwater. Um, earthworms have been shown to also eat microplastics, specifically polystyrene, um, if it's in the soil around them. So we know things at the very, very bottom of the food chain are eating microplastics. But you and I, we don't eat those, so why do we care? Well, there's this thing called bioaccumulation. So bioaccumulation is just the concentration of toxins up the food chain. And in this case, the toxin is plastics. So what happens is you have something like a plastic that gets eaten by plankton. And each plankton might only eat, say, 10 pieces of plastic. That video was a little dramatic because it was done under laboratory conditions. So the only source that they had around them was plastics. So it was a little more dramatic than what you'd see in the wild. But say a wild zooplankton eats 10 plastics. Well, then you have a fish like an anchovy that's going to eat, you know, a few thousand zooplankton. Well, then all of, if all those zooplankton had eaten 10 plastics, then that anchovy has, you know, a couple thousand, couple tens of thousands pieces of plastic in their body. And then something like a squid might come along and eat the anchovies and they're gonna eat a hundred anchovies 
And now we're up into a magnitude of a million pieces of microplastics in that squid body. And then something like a tuna, which we as humans tend to eat at the top of the food chain, might eat that squid. And now we've gone up another order of magnitude and that number of plastics is probably up into the billions for that tuna. Now, if you do eat meat, you've probably eaten more than one piece of tuna in your lifetime. And so that increasingly concentrates those toxins in our body. And this happens with things that don't break down easily. And we all know plastics don't break up in the environment. They don't go away. So we know that they're staying in the tissues of these organisms. So we know that this is gonna end up in our body through our food. And then we also know things that are filter feeders. So things like mussels and clams, they can't tell the difference between a food particle in the water and a plastic particle in the water. So they indiscriminately eat everything around them. And then you and I will eat something like that or other marine organisms will eat them and they're gonna get all of those things in their bodies. So that's why, even a small amount of something like plastics in the environment, microplastics can have a huge impact because as we progress up the food chain, those impacts get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we know that humans are eating them. So there have been studies that have shown that it's in our feces. So we know that it comes out. Um, a recent study just came out um, showing that it's in uh, some placental fluid of women. Um, it was a, a really small study. It only included about eight women. So it was just like kind of a study, but six of the eight women tested positive for having microplastics in their placenta. So of course, more research needs to be done, but kind of scary just to think about. Um, the reason that this is bad for us is we do know that microplastics leave our digestive tract. So what microplastics do when they enter our body, of course, some go straight through, but what they do is they leave our GI tract and they go into what's called our hemolymph. So that's our blood system and our lymph nodes, and they concentrate there. So super important parts of our body. Those are what circulates everything around our body. And that's where microplastics tend to hang out when they're in humans. Now, that sounds gross on its own, just plastics, but in theory, plastic is inert. The reason that's a problem is just like in that video that we saw is plastics can be concentration sites for other toxins, um, specifically uh, what are called um, persistent organic pollutants or POPs. So these toxins are what are called hydrophobic. So they don't like water. So if they end up in an aquatic environment, they're gonna to try to attach to something that's not water. And microplastics, because they're tiny and they have a big surface area compared to their volume, are basically the perfect concentration site for these pollutants. Um, a really common pop that you're probably familiar with is DDT. So that's probably um, the one that you're most familiar with. And we all know the impacts of DDT, not necessarily on humans, but the negative impacts that they can have on the environment. Um, so when microplastics are in the environment and there's also POPs present, it can increase the concentration of POPs in a certain area. And it's not just with POPs, there's other pollutants um, that can concentrate around these microplastics. And then we eat them or drink them and they end up inside of our bodies. Uh, and then I, I mentioned this already, but when we talked about our composting programs, um, we said we went from that 50% down to 10. Um, contamination is still a problem. Uh, EcoCycle, we're currently working on outreach to Canadian programs because now Canadian programs are at that 50% level and we'd like to get them down um, to just having a couple programs. So we're still working on decreasing composting as a source. Okay, so we know microplastics are a problem. I scared you enough. Let's talk about some things that you and I can do. Um, so 
I know that it is hard. Most of you guys have heard so many times about making small personal changes. And sometimes it can seem like your small shift is not enough. Um, but they do make a difference. Um, so one of the biggest things, which of course we're doing plastic free, free July. So this is a great time to start that. Using less plastic is huge. Um, nurdles can be up to 10% of microplastic uh, contamination. And we know that without making plastic, we reduce nurdles. So by stopping that at its source, by using less plastic, um, driving less, using alternate forms of transportation, so because we know anywhere from 10 to 28, 30% of microplastics come from our car tires, reducing the amount that we drive, um, avoiding synthetic clothing. I'll talk in more detail about how we can do that. Um, using a microfiber filter, and I'll give you a couple sources for that. And then composting properly so that you've heard Rosie say it, I'm sure a hundred times, when in doubt, throw it out. If you're not sure, throw it away, don't put it in the compost. Um, and then this is one of the things that I need to remind myself of is, uh, this is a quote by Confucius, uh, the man who moves a mountain begins by carrying away small stones. So our small changes do add up to big mountains. So looking for alternate fabrics. Yes, someone asked, bike tires do still have microplastics, which is the big bummer, right? You're like, I'm gonna bike to save my carbon emissions. Um, but they do erode less than car tires because there's not as much weight on them. Um, looking for more synthetic or less synthetic clothing. So things that you want to avoid are things like polyester, PVC, um, pleather, basically, um, acrylic, those are like the big, we know that they're made out of plastic. Things that you wanna look for are cotton, linen, hemp. Um, Tencel is kind of a new um, material, wool, silk. There's all sorts of like um, vegan leathers that aren't plastic out there on the market now. It's really cool. Um, I've seen them made out of like cactus and all sorts of cool things. So looking for those alternatives, if it comes from a plant, that's what you want or an animal if you're not vegan. Um, so those are the things you're looking for for environmental reasons. Um, so uh, shoes, you can look for shoes that are actually rubber and not plastic. I have found a pair of running shoes that are actually a rubber sole and have no plastic in them. I can put a link um, below. I've only had them for a couple of weeks, so I can't attest to um, how long they last, but it is so looking for shoes that are actually a true rubber sole and not a plastic rubber sole. They do exist um, and there are becoming more and more options available. Um, so microfiber filters. So there's a couple different options. So um, one of the easiest ones is getting a guppy friend washing bag. So um, you just toss your clothes in and you go and you do your laundry as normal. Um, these are great. I rent so I can't attach something to my house. So it's a great if you can't do modifications on your house, um, not as effective as something like uh, this image. This is a microfiber filter. Um, so they range in price from anywhere. Uh, this one right here is about $45 um, to about $150. So there's a big uh, price range, um, but they all need to fit into, you have to mount them to your house. So you have to have the option to be able to mount something onto your lot washing machine and then you basically just empty the bag so all those microfiber filters have a bag in them that catch the filters and then you can dump them um, in your landfill trash so they don't end up washing down your water system um, and then like the picture of the guppy friend bag you'll see after a couple washes you'll get like build up in the seams and you just want like scoop it out every so often And then 
looking for those sneaky plastics in compost, um, avoiding fruit stickers. Most gums have plastic in them, so making sure to avoid um, spitting your gum into the trash. Um, receipts, plastic coated paper, and then oxo-degradables. So, um, yeah. Uh, Oxo-degradables are those sneaky things that try to look like they're compostable. So when we're putting things in the compost, we wanna look for things that have those um, BPI um, certified labels that actually say that they're compostable. An oxo-degradable will, instead of having that label, will say something like biodegradable, degradable, It'll often say biodegradable and recyclable on it at the same time. And what these are is these are actually a conventional plastic um, that has an extra metal ion inserted into the plastic chain. So it just causes the plastic to break up easier. So if a plastic bag was made out of um, an oxodegradable, so a traditional plastic bag might sit and not break up for 20 years, but an oxo-degradable bag will break up into smaller pieces in two years. So the original intention behind it was these plastics wouldn't be an entanglement risk to wildlife. So there was a good intention behind the creation of these oxo-degradables, but now marketers are using them us to trick us into thinking that they're compostable products. Um, so making sure you're looking for that word compostable. Um, in the United States, it has to say compostable or be BPI or, and BPI certified for it to be able to go in the compost. If it doesn't say compostable, it cannot go in the compost. Um, that word compostable means something here. So biodegradable, degradable, those don't mean anything. They're actually not um, legislated. So there's no rules around them. So before I do questions, Rosie has some Plastic Free July stuff that she wants to um, insert and then we'll go through some questions. Yeah. Um, uh, Britt, do you wanna take down the screen? Yeah. Cool, so I just wanted to, yeah. Um, talk about actions going forward because we supplied some things to do some um ways to reduce your microplastic production or your engagement in the the problem um so i, I wanted to say that the um plastic free july challenge is something that i posted in the very beginning in the chat and i'll put it here one more time for everybody um so again plastic free july is something that um we did not make up ecocycle it's an existing organization in the global movement. And you can just, if you just Google Plastic Free July, you can read all about it. But EcoCycle is happy to um, engage with it um, every year. So I think this is like our fifth year doing it. And we kind of do our own Plastic Free July programming. So um, we write up all of this stuff, all of these ways that you can um, work through the challenge. And it, the challenge is really like just meet you wherever you are. So for some folks, it's like cutting out just disposable coffee cups that's all they do for the whole month and then for other folks it's like this very comprehensive um process where they're identifying which plastics they're using and they're cutting them out and they're um yeah looking at their clothes and they're looking at things like their tires and it's a whole um makeover for them so it's really just like a no pressure thing just to help you reduce your plastics um you can sign up in the link that i just um put in the chat uh, but i also wanted to say ellen um orleans our wonderful friend from the city of Boulder and an eco leader brought up that um, one of the other ways that she likes to um, break free from plastics is to elect legislators that are working on this problem and they care about the environment and that's such a good thing to bring up. That's something that I always try to bring up in all webinars and everything really that we ever put out. So um, this idea of individual responsibility, individual actions versus in infrastructural and kind of community um, level actions. So all of these things that we've been talking about buying, um, you know, a guppy bag or reducing your plastic or driving less. These are all kind of privileged things. There's not, there's a lot of people that can't do those and can't engage with those solutions. Um, and even if we did, 
which you know we should if we can and if you if that's available to you it's accessible to you um that's just like all of us working against this system which is trying to make us use all this plastic and trying to um you know get us to be swept away in this plastic river this is a system that's been built for a long time it's been building around us um and we have to exist in it so actions like the guppy bag or refusing a disposable cup or driving your um you know walking more than driving those are all you working against the system and um, we need to work on the system itself as well. So these are all great things to do if you have access to these solutions, but keep in mind that our bigger, not big, but our, at the same time, we have to be working on infrastructural legislative um, systemic issues. So an example of that is that we are so excited that we just passed the most comprehensive plastic bill ever in the state of Colorado, like last week, two weeks ago. I'm excited. Time flies, we all screamed. It was a really exciting time. I'll send out more information about that bill, but it was thanks to folks like you. Oh, yeah. Duke. He's excited too. He's like, yes, <laughs> the bill. Duke, you did it. Um, so thanks to folks like you who um, made that happen. And I will send out more information. You can read more about it, but I just always, 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 every time I talk, <laughs> really every time I talk, um, I, um, I like to mention that like, yeah, do your individual th stuff, but also let's build a system that works for all of us so that we're not all fighting against mm -hmm. freaking hard to avoid plastics. Um, and let's see. Um, the, the Break Free from Pollution Act at the federal level, which has been introduced um, to Congress, ha also excludes those it has a provision to require fruit stickers to be compostable. So nice. that's something that's pretty cool within that bill. Um, it's a much larger bill, but specifically related to what we talked to today, that's something in that bill. And I'll send out information. So uh, we, the legislation that we just talked about is Colorado specific. And I know that not all of you are in Colorado. So I'll also send out the Break Free From Plastic um, national bill, which is, yeah, it's federal, sir, or it's national. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, you have a lot of great questions in the Q&A. You can add them um, as you think of them. I am going to do the why not send compostables to the landfill because it just came up and um, it's just right there. So I'm going to answer it. So we'll answer it live um, and it's just like we'll click that button. So just listen if it's your question <laughs> or listen if it's not your question if you're interested. Okay, so um, this is a question. It says why not send compostables to the landfill? like the Denver area landfill that captures methane and powers up to 3,000 homes every year. So this is a um, kind of a debate, I guess. It's uh, definitely a lot of misconceptions around it. So the whole reason that we want to be composting is because um, nature has this beautiful process in which organics are built to break down, return nutrients to the soil, and then grow new stuff. Um, and when we break that cycle, <laughs> when we, uh, we, we like to break the cycle as humans, so we put um, the stuff in a landfill instead and all of those organic and breaking down and, and decomposing, um, they are put in an airtight environment, which is what the landfill is, and rather than decompose like they should, they um, anaerobically decompose, decompose, which means they break down very, very slowly and also they emit methane in the process and methane is a very potent greenhouse gas in terms of heat trapping um, capability on the short term in our atmosphere. So we, it's one that we really want to not be releasing into the atmosphere. So um, part of the requirement for, like landfills are required to capture the methane and kind of burn it off into energy that powers homes. And I'm doing this because like, it doesn't really happen like that. And it certainly doesn't happen all the time. Um, landfills they're like they weren't originally built to be capturing methane that's just like something that they do as a like an after the fact thing they kind of burn it off like if you drive past a landfill you can see like a, it being burnt off um and yeah so they can't cap the um they they have these cells and they cap them but they can't cap them like immediately after putting every anything in so there's just stuff emitting methane in the meantime and then even then it's that's just kind of a band-aid that's just kind of something that's like this makes it less terrible um when in reality when we take all of those organics and um put them in the compost instead we um are doing this huge we're not only avoiding methane um, emissions we're creating this huge environmental and social um, solution. 
So we're taking the organics out of the landfill. That means that the landfill is not emitting, emitting methane at all, which is great. We don't want methane emissions at all. It's also the landfills would be half as full because every given landfill is pretty much um, more or less 50% organic. So it's like it's food waste, it's cardboard, it's yard waste, um, you know, it's compostables. And so if we took all those um, organics and put them in the compost, then our landfills would be empty or not emit methane. Then all of that stuff in the compost then can actually break down in the way that it's supposed to, in the way that it is designed to by mother nature. We don't even have to um, make up a process. It already exists and it's perfect. So all of that stuff, when it has access to air, will actually decompose. It'll actually break down. It won't emit methane. Um, it'll, it'll go away. Like we won't have waste everywhere. Um, and it'll return nutrients to the soil, which is what it is. <laughs> again, it's designed to do. That's what that process is. So then we have um, more nutrient dense food because we're just wasting the nutrients now. And then um, we also actually, when we put that final product, that compost onto our soils, onto our farms and our, our gardens, our backyards, um, those, uh, the soil can actually draw carbon out of the atmosphere. And it's called carbon farming. And I'll send out more, I'll, I can send out some information about that in the follow-up email. So I could talk about this for hours and I have a whole webinar about this where, in which I do talk about it for hours. But basically if we're taking organics and putting them in the landfill, we have methane and we're filling up our landfills and we're wasting nutri nutrients. Even if we burn off the methane, <laughs> that's just like a, a little band-aid. If we take all this stuff and put it in the compost, we're returning nutrients to our food, feeding more people. Uh, the waste is actually going away in a positive way. We're not emit emitting methane and we can actually draw carbon out of the atmosphere. So it's a win, 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 win. Um, and someone just asked about um, bones. So, oh, hi, Sherry. Um, so yeah, bones can actually, um, like meat stuff can be put into uh, the compost in Boulder County which a lot of people don't know. Okay, great question. Um, Lori, thank you for that. Um, Britt, do you wanna just like look at and see what you wanna yeah. answer? You guys uh, talked, you guys put it in the chat and I clicked that we were answering it live because Brittany actually went over it. Um, um, so someone asked about um, the toxicity of, of plastics in humans um, and the pops. So currently, the WHO says, um, specifically with drinking water, um, that we should be more concerned about other contaminants in water than plastics. Um, so things like Giardia that causes diseases are more concerning to human health right now with the data that we have with plastics, but they are like, but we just don't know. And right now we know that the other ones are bad. <laughs> Um, so they want uh, like water treatment facilities to focus more on removing um, viruses and bacteria from their water systems than plastics. But if you're removing viruses and bacteria, you're probably catching a lot of microplastics along the way. Um, right now, there really is very, very, very little data on human um, health and microplastics and toxicity. Um, any of the studies about them in our bodies are less than five years old. So we have just figured out that we have them in our bodies. So we don't really have good data on how they're impacting us yet because we just don't know. Um, let's see, someone asked about quarter balls. I, the quarter balls just, I think they help some, but a, a bat to me, the bags that catch microfibers just seem much more effective than something that wraps. Um, it has to be a larger fiber for the cora balls to catch. Cora balls are designed to look like coral, so they look like a little ball that you toss in your laundry machine. Um, and to me, the guppy bag is like the same price and has uh, better results. Um, and then someone asked about, Juniper asked, Microplastic tracking is difficult. Tracking is difficult. Are there any scientific efforts to track them? There is a recent paper working towards tracking ocean plastics via satellite. Yes. So there is that. Um, there are tons of nonprofits that are doing it. Um, there are buoys all over the world's ocean that are being used for lots of things. And now those buoys are also being used to track um, microplastics in addition to a lot of the other basic 
temperature data that they're using. Um, Blue Ocean Project is one that's doing that. There's other nonprofits that are doing the same thing. The UN is doing it. Um, but a lot of it at this point is kind of piecemeal. Um, and there isn't a whole lot of getting it totally collected um, together yet because it's so new and really it's only been in like the last 30 years that we've even known that they were a problem. Um, and then Anne, oh, Anne said, I didn't see plastic bags or styrofoam on the chart. Um, so this was focused on um, things that were already microplastics. So it's really hard to tell if a microplastic in the ocean where it came from. So those anything that has been broken up from a primary microplastic would have fit into that city dust category. Um, so that's why there isn't a specific source for that um, there in that chart. You guys ask good questions. Um, and then what personal care items are what kind of enforcement can be levied against known dumpers? So the problem is, is a lot of the dumping happens in international waters. And when things happen in international waters, in theory, um, the UN should be doing it, but a lot of these international treaties on dumping have very um, little teeth behind them. So they might say that this is illegal, but there isn't really an enforcement agency to back it up because it's in international waters. So there isn't a country um, to say like, you're in our waters, we're gonna catch you. Um, so there are like, if it happened in US territorial waters and a polluter gets caught, they will be fined and there will be a fine levied against them. But when it happens in the middle of the Pacific ocean, it gets a lot shadier on who should do the fining. Um, in theory, the home country of where the ship comes from should be the one who gets fined and does the fining. Um, but like I said, when things happen in international waters, lots of things happen out there. Um, oh, someone asked, are tires not made out of rubber? So tires used to be made out of rubber, but um, in the 1920s, uh, DuPont, good old DuPont, um, created what's called vulcanized rubber and modified the tire. Um, so tires are actually now not rubber and they are mostly plastic. Um, they also have lots of other things. They're mostly zinc, um, have other minerals in them. So tires are not made out of natural rubber. They are made out of a plastic polymer. Um, you, yeah, go for it. I was just gonna say, that's the case for so many things where we know we call things like we call them the material that they originally were made of. And then so many of those materials have then been replaced since been replaced with plastic. And so it's really confusing. Um, like I get questions all the time about why cellophane can't go in the compost. Cellophane was originally made of plant fiber and now it is a kind of a blanket term for clear plastic. And so that's, you know, um, you, we don't want the plastic wrapping that's actually made of polypropylene around a Trader Joe's flowers, for example, for example, to go in the compost because it's not, Solving. Um, same with like I was saying, a lot of Dixie cups were originally coated in wax and other um, their petroleum yeah. <laughs> coated. Um, so that's something that is um, important to keep an eye on is that it might not be necessarily made of what you think it is made of. Yeah. Um, Someone asked, they're in, impossible to filter. Microfibers are extremely difficult to filter. Um, so some microplastics. So generally the definition is just smaller than five um, micrometers, but there are something called um, uh, nanoplastics and they can be so, so, so tiny. Um, and the microfibers are probably the most difficult to keep out of water streams. Those are so small that they can actually blow in the wind. Um, they're so small and light, um, those nanoplastics. So once they get that tiny, it is extremely difficult to get them back out. So it's kind of like the toothpaste is out of the tube at that point. And that's something also, uh, we have two questions asking about whether there's microplastics in plants and correct me if I'm wrong, Grit, but um, 
I, nanoplastics at least have been found as being uprooted through plants, which then pose the same problem when you concern the plants. Yeah. Um, they tend to be more of an issue in um, plant roots. They tend not to migrate all the way up to the top of plants. So if it's something like an apple tree that absorbs them through their roots, not super likely that that many of the plastics are going to make it into the apple, but something like a beet or a potato or a turnip um, that grows underground, they're going to have a much higher concentration of those microplastics. So that at least is what the most current research is sowing. So things that grow big fruits high and they have to spread really far, not as much of an issue, but like those things that we eat that come from the ground if they're growing in plastics. He just said, I love potatoes. That's what I was just thinking. <laughs> now I'm not, and like, you are probably more likely to get plastic in your drinking water than from your potato. I will, okay, yeah, I would never blame the potato. Don't blame the potato. I love potatoes too. Anna says, what items and personal care items should we be looking for as plastics? I'm not sure if you mean like, where can we replace plastics or where are microplastics? So as I said, there's a lot of um, like the exfoliant ones. Mm -hmm. um, and isn't there legislation? Paste. And toothpaste. Toothpaste, like uh, those like whitening toothpaste. Um, there is legislation in Colorado. You can't buy it in Colorado. It is banned for sale here in Colorado. Um, and many states do have bans against um, the microbeads. Um, they used to be really trendy in like the acne scrubs when I was in high school. Um, a good thing to bring up also is that we just said that um, biodegradable is like a huge greenwashing term. And so that like I, all day long, I see cups and bags specifically that say biodegradable. And as we said, that just means that it's designed to break down into smaller pieces of plastic quicker rather than actually decomposing. But um, in some cases, in personal care items, like in, in soaps and stuff, it'll say biodegradable, and that means that that is real. So it's very confusing that when you see biodegradable on like a plastic product, don't buy it, avoid it, don't put it in the compost. Um, but that is labeling that is legitimate in, um, in personal care products. That means that it doesn't have those plastic microbeads. And I think that's because it's regulated by different agencies, so they use different words. And I mean, it's so confusing to be a consumer and that's why we have to just change the systems as well because yeah. <laughs> yeah. um i had one that i was just gonna answer and now i forget which one it was oh anything think okay so anthony said it's anything being done to make the producers of plastics and microplastics responsible for the end use and that is such a great question i actually we did a whole webinar on it's called extended producer responsibility and uh, yeah, exactly. EcoCycle all day long is screaming that we should not, consumers and recyclers should not have to be the ones responsible for these problems because in fact, the producers are the ones that should be in, in, um, in charge of it um, and bearing that burden um, financially and otherwise. So we, I, will, I can send out that link as well. It's a two hour presentation on what is being done, what we think should be done. Uh, the short answer is that plastics the plastics industry currently is not taking very much responsibility at all and they should take a whole lot and there is a lot of um stuff in motion legislative on this so i'll send that out i'll write myself a note awesome. so someone asked if there's any way that you can buy tires that are only rubber i don't think that they're available at all anymore because there's not a demand so the the synthetic materials that we use now are actually softer than um traditional rubber tires. So it gives us like a nice smoother ride. Um, so as far as I am aware, they don't exist because there wouldn't be a whole lot of consumer demand for it because not many people would be willing to buy a tire that would significantly reduce the quality of the ride of their vehicle. Um, and so, and it would be, exorbitantly expensive to make something out of pure rubber. So natural rubber costs way, way, way more um, than the synthetic materials and it tends to cost way more. Um, like I can think like wetsuits, neoprene uh, is made from rubber and you can buy natural rubber wetsuits versus synthetic ones. The natural rubber ones are easily double the cost of the 
plastic ones. Um, this one, so Kate says, has EcoCycle been invited to present at events where plastic producers are present um, or where we might find present these findings um, as humans? You would think that they'd be concerned that they are consuming their own toxic products. You would think that, Kate. You would, you wouldn't you? Um, so yeah, the, the answer is so yeah, EcoCycle has been around since 76. We are one of the, I like to say founders of the zero waste movement because I, I wasn't there, but I feel like, you know, we've been a, a for, we've been in the forefront since then. Um, and we've been very outspoken and we, yeah, so we, we not only work on the local scale, but we also work on the statewide, um, the state scale, as I mentioned with the bill, but also nationally and even globally, we have a whole department that's just kind of like taking what EcoCycle is doing and exporting it as, as much as possible. And we, um, yeah, we have a team, um, Kate Bailey specifically is one of our wonderful coworkers who travels literally around the world giving presentations, but we also for sure are in, um, are in the same room as plastics producers all the time. Um, you know, we go to, there's stakeholder summits and meetings and um, conferences in which we're like, hey, Pepsi, can you not? And then like, they know, they hear us. Um, you would think that they'd be more concerned. It's it's a big infrastructural issue. Um, yes, so we are definitely part of the global conversation and uh, there are many other amazing uh, players who are also, we're part of a um, coalition called the, the Alliance for Mission-Based Recyclers uh, with the three other main nonprofit recyclers in the US and we do things like that because other recyclers don't necessarily have the same environmental uh, mission as EcoCycle as a nonprofit. Um, someone asked you where you can buy Guppy Friend bags. The Patagonia store sells them. Um, that's where I got mine. Um, I think the conscious market went out, is gone in Louisville, but they used to sell them. Um, but I think that's the only place where I can think of that you don't have to order one online is the Patagonia store. And I don't know if they have any currently. I haven't been in a long time. Um, someone asked, which is worse, using a plastic plate and putting it in the landfill or using a compostable plate and putting it in the landfill? Um, I would err on using compostables and put them in the landfill because then you are at least supporting a company that makes compostable products and you're driving the market towards compostables as opposed to plastic. But I, it's one of those like kind of a toss up to me. I don't know. Do you have a different opinion, Rosie? That's, I, again, to talk, could talk, talk all day about the single use uh, compost things. That's yeah. just, um, ultimately our answer is reusables are yeah. the best. Because anytime you use anything single use, whether it's compostable or not, um, you know, there's still a huge amount of resources input in that production process. And then, um, Anytime you can skip that process is better. So yeah, uh, like putting a compostable plate in the compost is better than putting a plastic plate in the trash. And sometimes we don't have access to the composting. So sometimes it goes to the compost and uh, then it's kind of a, a toss up. So again, EcoCycle as recyclers, we're like, before worrying about recycling and composting, worry about reusing and reducing because that's, we can't make a seamless transition over to like compostable single use. We just have to get rid of single use stuff as it, we can't like, we can't keep this system. <laughs> so, oh, someone asked a good question. I've seen some food packaging that says compostable, but doesn't say BPI certified. Um, com that word compostable is actually regulated. So I think sometimes, like, especially on like compostable utensils, I don't think they can fit the BPI, like they can't fit the whole label on it. So they just say compostable and that is fine. Um, and I think it's just, they don't have room for the logo always, but compostable is a legislated word and they are, if they put that word on their product, they are supposed to have gone through BPI certification testing. Um, I think sometimes they just don't put it on for aesthetic reasons, or like I said, with utensils, I think it's often space. Um, Someone asked, is it beneficial to recycle plastics at places like King Supers? I'm assuming you're talking about plastic bags, Ron. And as far as I'm aware, they send them to the same place that we do. They also send them to trucks to get turned into decking. So it's the same. 
I would say that there's a lot of contamination at the grocery store ones, though. So. Close to bringing it to the charm. Mm hmm. Yeah. At I, least the ones at my grocery store, people often use it as a trash can. Well, and taking, you know, taking your plastic bags that you get to a plastic bag recycling collection is great. And thank you for doing that. And again, ultimately, like skipping the plastic bag is the best thing to do. But. Oh, someone asked out a closed domestic loop for water, like gray water. Um, it would probably help with microplastic reduction just because it would be a higher filtration system. But I do not know enough about how that system would work. But I would assume that it would make a huge impact because if we were using a closed loop system for our water, um, we would have to filter it pretty intensely for us to be able to reuse it. Um, which would pull microfibers out of our water pretty thoroughly. Um. So many questions. I'm a bag lady when I go to Safeway, so sure. I love it. Me too. Me too. Um, oh, so empty the bag or the filter. So I put mine in my landfill trash um, to make sure that it ends up in the water. Of course, we all know that there's a chance that our landfill ends up in the water, but at least I know that it's not directly going into the water like it would from my clothing. Um, but there, of course, is always a chance that some mistake happens along the way with whatever you're sending to the landfill. But in theory, if it's going to the landfill, it's going to end up trapped for a really, really long time. Mohammed's question, too, is that it's they're they're designing it to be closed off from the soil and the water that and but there's a lot of transportation to get there it's not perfect and also the landfill isn't perfect yes but, it's but like uh, so part of my job um it's actually really cool i get to take kids on tours to the landfill so i actually become pretty good friends with the guys who run the landfill they really want to do the right thing for the environment too like the landfill guys are not bad guys. They want to protect the environment. They want to do the right thing. They want to keep all the trash in. We're the ones who make the trash. They're just trying to deal with it. Um, so the people who run our landfill do really want to do the best that they can. Um, Katie said, someone told my daughter that she didn't need to worry about plastic ending up in the oceans because we lived in, land, in a landlocked state. What would you say about that? That's such a good question. I actually get that a lot yeah. because in Colorado, like in other states, it's easier to pass plastics legislation like bipartisan in a bipartisan way because it's like, oh, we don't want to play in trash and you can see it every day on our beach. And here in Colorado, we're like, Ooh, we're somehow isolated from the water cycle, which we're not. Um, so, Britt, you can add to this, but I was just yeah. saying the water cycle, as I said, in the beginning there, they found microplastics in the Ar in Arctic snow where people have never brought plastic. So plastic is in the water cycle. All of our plastic is not just staying in the same place. There are river, like all of the water in the planet, on the planet is connected. And Colorado is not um, special in that way. Yeah, so I'm biased. I like to talk about the ocean because I'm a marine biologist, but we have aquatic systems here that are impacted by plastics when they end up in them. Um, and so we, someone posted like Cadis flies will use plastics as their larva. All of our wonderful, they're called macroinvertebrates. So any of those mostly insect larva, but other things that things like our trout rely on as a food source, um, will also consume microplastics the same way those zooplankton did. So they'll be impacted exactly the same way. Also, if plastic ends up as litter, it ends up in our soils and it's gonna break up into microplastics in our soils. Um, so even though we are just about as far away from the ocean as you can get in the United States, um, we still have huge impacts on the environment. Um, and our rivers do, well, unless it's flowing into the Colorado, do eventually lead to the ocean. So when plastic ends up in our rivers and streams, especially microplastics, they can still eventually end up in the ocean. Um, okay, parchment paper and tea bags. That's a really good question. We used to say like, yes, all the tea bags, throw them in the compost. And now we're like, no, 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 no. 
uh, there's a bunch of tea bags um, that came out that are like, even like the fancy ones you can picture, it's like a, tr it's like a pyramid and it's like made of plastic. But now even like the, the regular ones that you just like think are a regular um, tea bag have been found to have microplastics in them. Um, and then parchment paper, like I said, set, like a lot of stuff that we think about being wax is now petroleum based. So I, for parchment paper, look for a BPI. Yeah. Um, and I just switched to like loose leaf tea um, mm -hmm. when I can to just avoid the plastic because I don't want to add an additional potential source of drinking plastics. So, yeah, because um, I think it's not necessarily the bag itself. It's the glue that they use to seal the bags together um, is where the source of plastics are. Yes, Judith, you are right. Arkansas watershed flows right into the Gulf of Mexico, which is one of the largest plastic masses. You are correct. And part of that is because there are a lot of plastic refineries um, in the Gulf of Mexico. And so there are fairly regular nurdle spills into the Gulf of Mexico. So there is a lot of plastic biomass, uh, or not biomass, mass in the Gulf of Mexico, specifically um, in like Texas. Um, because of plastic production in that area. Yep. Nurdle spill sounds like a cute event. It does. It sounds so cute, but they're not. Um, wastewater being tested for COVID. It has been tested for plastic. I don't think it's been... Uh, w, the WHO did a study on testing wastewater for plastic um, that came out last year. I can see if I can find it and send it to Rosie so she can send it out in the materials. Um, did a pretty massive study, mostly focusing on U.S., Canada, and European countries um, on wastewater and plastic. Um, I think mostly because we have pretty extensive wastewater treatment facilities. Um, and to sum it up, there is plastic in our wastewater. Uh, a database of products or brands that are plastic free. So that's part of, um, yeah, our part of our plastic free July is like, we're, we walk you through like, go through your trash and see what your plastics are. And then like, if this is your most used plastic, here's a swap that we recommend. And as a nonprofit, we're not allowed to just be like, we love this one brand, but we have a lot of, um, yeah, uh, like generic swaps, you know, like beeswax wrap that we offer. Um, and I would also say that there are a lot of great um, zero waste resources locally again we're in boulder county but if you're wherever you are just searching like zero waste store is a great way to go here we have um simply bulk in longmont refill revolution closed uh their brick and mortar uh store in boulder but they're still online um someone I, ellen maybe sandy maybe mentioned um nude foods in boulder they're really great um and i can send out again i'll send out such an email for you guys that'll have all of this stuff um yeah. But yeah, I think uh, just in general, following, so signing up for Plastic Free July, even if you don't want to do the whole thing, um, yeah. you'll get a lot of and Part of it is new brands pop up all the time, so it's hard to keep track of new brands, which is great that sometimes there's a new sustainable brand um, that's making something new. Um, are there any methods for removing microplastics from soils? Um, as far as I'm aware, there's not, because we just became aware um, that they're an issue. So because we're just trying to understand the scope of the issue, there isn't a solution to the issue yet because we just figured out it's a problem. Um, so you can't create a solution until you understand the problem. So unfortunately, not a whole lot um, of solutions yet, but fortunately humans are pretty innovative and hopefully we'll be able to reduce that impact in general. Um, and people are putting in some great resources in the chat box, like Zero Market, yeah, which is a Denver refill store, um, village trading company, as well as Conscious uh, Merchant is also in Louisville, I would add. Um, so uh, someone asked if I can send out the chat box and yes, I will, I will download it and I will put it in a document and it's cute to read, but also like you can find resources. So I'll send that out as well. Um, what else, a guppy bag locally? The Patagonia store is the only place I've found them locally. That's where I got mine. So nice. that's where I got it. Um, 
And then I talked about the toxicity of pops because we don't, that's again, um, and I know it's really frustrating that I keep giving you the answer that we don't really know. Um, and a lot of this is we are just coming to understand the scope of the issue. And so funding is just shifting um, this direction. And I think also it's like our concern is the pops, but also like the concern is that we don't know. Like a lot of people don't put plastics, I harp on this a lot, but a lot of people don't put plastics and oil and gas together. They don't think about plastics being fossil fuels when it's the same thing. And, um, you know, all of the chemicals and all of the crazy stuff that's in, um, you know, that's involved with the fossil fuel production and plastic production, I just wouldn't, there's a lot that we don't want in our bodies and um, don't even know about. So I think that's part of the like bottom line about microplastics is like, we don't know, isn't that terrifying? Um, yeah, so like Ted put in um, a study about sperm count, which is like, I don't even know. Yeah, endocrine disruptors are, definitely um an issue with plastics and yeah and uh ddt which is one of those pops has been shown to reduce fertility in humans so it was one of those things they were like ddt is totally harmless and it wasn't um so and it impacted human fertility as well yeah um and then uh mushrooms so lot it's always cool when we see those things like like mushrooms and bacteria that eat plastic or styrofoam um, unfortunately, most of those have only been tested in like the laboratory setting and none of them have been taken out on the field. So no one knows um, if any of those organisms will do what they did in the lab in the environment um, because laboratory settings are so controlled and so carefully orchestrated and they got that result in the lab, which is great. And that's how science works, right? We do it in the lab first and then we take it to the field. Um, but there haven't been any studies where they've taken those um, field or those laboratory studies and taken them into the field yet. So as of now, all of those um, plastic eating bacteria or plastic eating microbes have only been tested in a lab setting and haven't progressed out into the, the much, much harsher environment, especially a open ocean aquatic environment is one of the harshest environments on the planet. Um, so if we're really wanting to deal with microplastics in the open ocean, um, it is a tricky, tricky place to send out something. Cool. Nice. Okay. Wow. I don't even know if we've ever answered all of the questions before. Usually we have so many questions that it takes so long, but we, because it's 4th of July weekend and usually the webinars are two hours. So I just made it two hours just because like we never know if we're going to have a million questions. And so we can like honestly end early. Um, I just want to end saying that um, this is a heavy topic and I'm sorry about that. A lot of environmental topics are heavy, um, but I always like to end by saying that I, it's, it could be really draining and exhausting to learn about all of these issues and feel like you can't, can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Um, but I would just like to say that I personally am sustained in this work because all I do pretty much is talk to people like you. Um, I go out into the community and I talk to um, folks who care and who want to do more. And, um, and as Brittany said, like there, you know, there is nothing more powerful than everyone doing something together. Like that's how everything has always gotten done. There's not anything that has ever gotten done. Um, that wasn't just a big community, um, movement of people who care. So I am, um, I'm happy, if anything, that we are, know more about microplastics now than we did before, um, and that there's more solutions than ever coming to um, fruition, that people are <laughs> um, uh, concerned about it, people are activating, um, even in my short life and career in zero waste, which is seven years, I, <laughs> the last few years is like the most I've ever seen people care and get Waited and get excited about zero waste and and plastics and the environment in general. So um, I thank all of you. And again, like that bill that we talked about wouldn't have happened without folks like you. So I thank you. We're so happy to interact with you and see you and talk to you. Um, I will send out, like I said, just a big old email um, with all of the resources that we talked about. So it'll be the recording, it'll be the slide deck, it'll be the chat box, it'll be the video link and the info about the bill and the uh, extended producer responsibility webinar, whole bunch of stuff coming your way. Um, 
and uh, if you ever have any questions, I am um, open to <laughs> a call, an email. You can always send me an email. Um, and I, you have my email because I sent the invite, but also I'll send out the follow-up um, email. And, and if you have questions specifically about microplastics, my email is just Brittany at EcoCycle. Yeah, and I'll, I'll CC her on the follow-up so you can have her email. Okay, so have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for spending your Thursday night with us. It's Thursday, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> go eat dinner if you haven't already. Go hug your pets. Thank you so much, and we will see you next time. Good night.